We're pleased to have Claire with us today to talk about the Gnostic principles. And now here is Claire. Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to be back with the Portland TS again <laughs> and, uh, and to get to know everybody. Um, I'm, I'm talking really about one of my favorite topics and that is um, the Gnostic gospels, Gnosticism in general. Um, and, and this is just a, it's a very slight introduction into a couple of the Gnostic Gospels. Gnosticism as a whole uh, is, is kind of mysterious. Most people believe that it started somewhere before the Common Era, somewhere around maybe 100, maybe even as far back as 200 uh, before the Common Era. And, and came on into the common era um, during the time when, when Jesus was alive and then uh, on through the development, uh, almost up to the time when the Roman Catholic Church uh, was, uh, was getting the, the canonical gospels together uh, uh, and really creating organized religion as we know it today. Gnosticism is uh, a very, what can I say, and a very eclectic uh, philosophy or theology. It's got a little bit of everything in it. Uh, you can find, in addition to uh, some Christian uh, theology, you can find Kabbalah, you can find uh, Zoroastrianism, you can find Judaism, you can find, uh, and even Buddhism, although very few people who write introductions to Gnosticism will mention uh, Buddhism philosophy because a lot of them aren't familiar with Buddhist traditions. And so they don't really see the, the threads that run through Gnosticism that I would pick out and say, well, that's, that's very Buddhist uh, in the way it, it is. So what we're going to do is just take a, a little bit of a, an overview um, and talk about the Gnostic Gospels, which were found in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. Um, most of them were found in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. The first gospel we're going to look at, the Gospel of Mary, uh, was not found there. It was actually found in, uh, and, and sold to the British Museum, or no, the, the museum in Berlin, Germany. In, uh, in the late 1800s, eight, about 1896. So that was an early one. Some believe that the Gospel of Mary, uh, which is uh, obviously about Mary Magdalene, uh, was maybe part of what was the, the Pista Sophia. S several Gnostic systems were developed uh, during these, these years. Um, and those included the, the Valentinian, the Manichaean, there was Balisades, there was Justinius. There's, there's a whole lot of them. We could go through those like forever. Um, it, they, it's really interesting. They each contain a little bit of, uh, of the uh, overviews of things, of uh, the different religious uh, and philosophical um, teachings of that era. Um, after Jesus uh, was uh, involved with uh, the formation of what we can now call Christianity, they incorporated Jesus into their philosophy. Um, and their, their, their primary philosophy was that uh, mankind was corrupt, that being a human was not a good thing, uh, and that earthly existence was a punishment for um, for this, this corruption, but yet all humans have a divine spark. We all have this divine spark within us. Um, and, and so the aim of human existence then was to die and to return to our divine source. So that's, uh, that's kind of the, the crux of a lot of it. Uh, a lot of it involves uh, learning to go within and find your inner, um, your inner self, your inner divine nature. Um, a lot of it looks at, you know, know thyself and, and the knowledge 
Um, and, and that's sort of where the Pista Sophia would come in too. A lot of that came from uh, the Pista Sophia and that, that knowledge wisdom idea. <clears throat> so the Gospel of Mary was found in 1896 and sent to the Berlin Museum for safekeeping. But the first translation uh, wasn't done until 1955. Um, and it's a uh, it's a rather old manuscript. And as I said, it, it may extend somewhat from the Pista Sophia um, and, and what that, uh, and the, the ideas that that uh, presented. Mary Magdalene is kind of, a, I guess you could say a, a, a mysterious figure. There's not a whole lot of women that are talked about in, uh, in the New Testament. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, Mary Magdalene, um, and maybe one other Mary, there was a Mary and Martha, was this Mary Magdalene or not, Mary, Mary of Magdala, um, there's some different opinions on that, but Mary Magdalene was presented as the intimate companion of Jesus, or uh, koinos, which is Greek for special companion. There's a lot of arguments about this. Um, people do not, for whatever reason, Christians do not like to think that Jesus had a woman in his life. Um, and some people say, well, um, if Jesus being a Jew was a true Jew, he would have had, uh, he would have had a wife. He would have been married very early on. Um, and, and yet, if you can recall, Jesus didn't really follow Jewish law. It was uh, it was just the way he, you know, the, the law, he came to fulfill the law. And so he often uh, denigrated Jewish law. He plucked corn on the Sabbath. He didn't wash, do the ritual washings of plates and so forth before he ate. And so Jesus was not what I would call a good Jew. Uh, he was very much uh, against the 621, I believe it was, uh, Jewish laws and felt that, um, that religion had gone to more of a law than what he promoted, which was love and compassion. There's also uh, some uh, manuscripts that have Jesus uh, going back to India uh, or going to India when he was 13 after his bar mitzvah at, uh, in Jerusalem, when he was arguing with the scribes and Pharisees about religion. And so he might have picked up the idea too that uh, while uh, women, women could be followers of a disciple, you know, the Buddha had uh, women followers. All the uh, Buddhist teachers down through history have always had female followers. So the fact that Mary Magdalene was a companion, she was often called a disciple in some of the books. So she was also a, a disciple um, and followed Jesus uh, and, and the disciples. Of course, you can imagine how some of the disciples felt about having a, a female amongst their group. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Artists have often depicted her with red or golden hair and some of, her, some of them have her holding a jar that was used to hold ointment for the purpose of anointing. Um, and some artists have her in the presence of a skull, which would link uh, to Golgotha or the place of the skull where the crucifixion took place. Remember, uh, Mary was, Mary Magdalene was at the cross uh, when Jesus was uh, crucified. I think the most interesting thing is so many Christians down through the years have said, well, she was a prostitute. Um, even the Catholic Church has taken that title away from her, which is a good thing. I never thought that was really, really a nice thing because there was never any proof of that. Um, but she's the only woman mentioned in all four Gospels besides uh, Jesus's mother. Um, and of course, we know Paul had women uh, that were missionaries and worked with him. But she, in the Gospels, um, she the, was the only woman mentioned besides his mother. 
she kind of got the prostitute label because uh, Jesus uh, is said to have healed her by freeing her from seven demons. And we don't know what the demons were, uh, but uh, supposedly she was healed from seven demons. And that kind of is what got her uh, as a disciple of Jesus or, or an intimate companion of Jesus. Um, and again, as I mentioned, she was one of three, along with John the Apostle and Jesus' mother, who waited at the foot of the cross during the crucifixion. And she was the first to see Jesus, res Jesus resurrected from the tomb and is uh, considered the Apostle of the Apostles by St. Augustine, which I thought was pretty interesting, um, given St. Augustine's uh, uh, feelings about uh, women. And, and obviously from the Catholic Church as well, uh, not only the Catholic Church, but, but others. We'll talk a little bit about, about that. In 1969, the Catholic Church freed her from the prostitute label, which I thought was, was good. There was an earlier manuscript, in addition to the Pistis Sophia, uh, called The Questions of Mary, but it was, it was lost, although... There were some mentions of it in uh, some of the people who were apologists for uh, Gnosticism that mentioned that uh, manuscript, The Questions of Mary. And here we know about the Pista Sophia because the British Library contains what they call additional 5114 manuscript known as the Pista Sophia. There's a picture of her uh, sort of looking like. Uh, a modern woman, uh, and she has a book, and she, you can see the skull. Um, I couldn't find one. There was a lot of uh, paintings that had her depicted with red hair. I couldn't find one that I thought was really good, and they, you know, they wanted a lot of money for them. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll do this one because it, it does show the skull. What I'm using today as my uh, as a reference is um, this book. It's called the Gnostic Bible. It's a thick book, as you can see, and it's got um, all of the Gnostic writings that have been found so far. And this includes a lot of the pagan Gnostic. Remember, there was we're not just talking about when we talk about Gnosticism. It's not just involving Christianity or uh, other uh, religions of that time, but it's also a, a pagan uh, uh, religion. And so there are a lot of pagan Gnostic writings that I find really fascinating. I, I really like it. Um, and so that's what I'm kind of using um, in, uh, in reference. The first six pages of the Gospel of Mary are missing. Uh, like so many things that happened to the, um, to the scrolls that were found in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. A lot of the pages went missing. Uh, some of the, it said that the young man who found these uh, jars full of texts, his mother used some of the um, texts as uh, to start a fire, start a cooking fire. So we don't know how many were, were ruined, how many got lost, but there is a, there's a, a lot of the text missing in a lot of these gospels. Kind of interesting that, that the very first uh, words we hear on, on page seven, as because the students are speaking uh, with the savior is about matter. And the question is, what is matter? And will matter last forever? And that's kind of a scientific question. And it's interesting to me that they actually thought about things like this um, back in those times, because we think, well, you know, um, did they really think scientifically back then? And yeah, they did, they did. Um, because Plato was a very scientific writer, Plato and Aristotle, Socrates. And so what is matter and will it last forever? These scientific questions that lead us really to some similarities with Buddhist philosophy, particularly that of impermanence and how matter is composed and decomposed, which 
obviously, uh, when you look at uh, Buddhist philosophy or quantum physics as well, which is very parallel to Buddhism, you can see uh, the idea that matter is composed uh, and decomposed by mind, that all is created by mind and nothing is created in the mind. Everything is created in the mind by the mind and nothing has any inherent reality from its own side. And so the idea of impermanence uh, as you know, Jesus taught them that you know, all nature, all formed things, all creatures uh, exist in and with one another and will be resolved into their own roots. All that arises and is, uh, is of matter will disintegrate and disappear. And then Peter had an interesting question. What is the sin of the world? And Jesus answered, there is no sin. It is you who make sin exist when you act according to the habits of your corrupted nature. This is wherein sin a lot, where sin lies. And this is very much a Buddhist idea. Um, and it's also a part of the, the idea that uh, actually uh, that sin always exists within us. That, that's why it's inner knowledge that's so important. Um, and and to, to return to the source, the divine, the principle, there is no sin that we make sin exist. What creates sin? You remember when, uh, when Jesus was talking about the law and Jesus said, it's the law that creates sin. Uh, the apostle Paul kind of goes into that as well, that uh, sin is created by the law. If we had no laws, there would be no sin. So uh, you act according to these habits of your corrupted nature. And of course, in Gnosticism, human beings are of the nature of corruption. Um, and in Buddhism, there's no sin except for ignorance and, and not ignorance in, say, knowledge, book learning, that sort of thing, but uh, ignorance of the nature of humankind and how all phenomena exist. This is kind of that idea behind the pistis in Pista Sophia. The pistis is is the knowledge, but Blavatsky often points out, it's not the knowledge as we look at knowledge, but it's this, it's this knowing, it's the gnosis, uh, uh, the gnosis, inner knowing. It's the, like the Oracle at Delphi, know thyself. The gospel of Mary says that the teacher came in order to help free us from the ignorance that keeps us captive to the world of corruption. And so when you look at, at uh, Jesus' uh, reason for being, um, being on earth, for coming to uh, save mankind, perhaps liberate mankind is a better word. Liberation is the word that the Buddhists use. Um, and so to be liberated from this ignorance that we have, the ignorance that, uh, that we... Uh, that we exist permanently, that all things exist uh, in, uh, in dependence on external sources and not internal. So we are freed from the ignorance that keeps us captive to this world of corruption. That too could have been a, a very Buddhist idea uh, if in fact Jesus um, did spend uh, 17 years in India as some of the uh, ancient texts say. Next, the Gospel of Mary speaks of our attachment to matter, which is another one of the three poisons. There's ignorance, hatred, and attachment. And that too is where we get a lot of the, this idea that perhaps a lot of the ideas in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene come from uh, Buddhism and, and Buddhist teachings. Jesus advises, be in harmony. Be in harmony or the Buddhist tradition that one should live in equanimity or even mindedness. 
And, and that even-mindedness requires that we don't uh, have attachment to matter. We do not want to get attached to the things in this world that would create our sorrow and our suffering. He also, uh, Jesus advises us to be vigilant and allow no one to mislead you saying, here it is, or there it is, for it, the truth, is within you where the Son of Man dwells. And I think that's a really important piece of advice. Um, so many times we see people who, uh, you know, we, we all say, you know, especially in, in theosophy, you know, well, we're seekers, you know, we're seeking, we want, the, everybody wants to find the truth. Um, the truth, is it out there or is it in here? Well, Jesus advises that uh, in the gospel of Mary Magdalene to be vigilant and don't be misled by people saying that, oh, I have all the truth. How, how many times do we know of people who've gotten into real trouble by allowing themselves to be led by somebody who says, oh, follow me, I have all the truth. Um, and, uh, you know, we've all heard those stories, whether it's uh, Jim Jones in Guyana or, uh, boy, there's, there's a lot of them that we can think of in the past 30, 40 years that have led people astray by saying they have all the truth. And, and Jesus says that the truth is within you where the Son of Man dwells. In, in other Gospels, in the, in the canonical Gospels, Jesus says, you know, when he was asked, where is the kingdom of heaven? And he said, the kingdom of heaven is within. So this whole idea of gnosis or inner knowledge uh, of having the truth within you, um, you know, know thyself, that is very, uh, very much present in all of the, of the Gnostic gospels. This idea that you must know yourself. If you're going to return to the source, you must know yourself. And of course, Jesus didn't think much of the Jewish laws. And so it would be reasonable that he would advise, impose no law other than what I have witnessed. Do not add more laws to those given in the Torah. So you can say, well, those were the Ten Commandments. So is that the only laws there were? Probably. But you know how, you know, we know firsthand how leaders love laws, don't they? The more laws they make, the more, you know, the more trouble we get into. And, and so here has, is Jesus saying, you know, don't add any more laws other than just what's in the Torah. Um, Mary Magdalene was believed to hold sacred knowledge or secret knowledge. Um, Jesus often talked to Mary Magdalene um, and he often told her things. And obviously, you know, Peter, Peter always had his, you know, his uh, uh, mind, you know, being very uh, upset when it came to things. He was kind of hot tempered, actually. Um, and, uh, and Peter didn't like it that Jesus only talked to Mary about certain things. And he said to Mary, sister, we know that the teacher loved you differently from other women. This could indicate that uh, he did have an intimate relationship with Mary Magdalene um, that was noted by Peter that, you know, the teacher loved you differently from other women. And then Peter wants her to tell uh, them uh, things that Jesus told her. Uh, that maybe he didn't tell the disciples. He was really jealous of the fact that, uh, that Jesus seemed to have this relationship with Mary Magdalene that, and, and told her things that he did not tell them. After the teacher leaves them and ascends into heaven, Andrew spoke and said to his brother, Tell me, what do you think of these things she's been telling us? As for me, I do not believe that the teacher would speak like this. These ideas are too different from those we have known. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah, very different from those we have known. So uh, at that time, and even today, how many religions think it's impossible for women 
to be able to know things like this, to be able to know spiritual things, you know, and, and, and basically he's calling Mary Magdalene a liar. I don't believe the teacher would speak to her like this. Why would he tell her these things when she's a woman and, you know, we're the one that need, to, that should be told these things. Peter added, how is it that the teacher talked in this manner with the woman about the secrets of which we ourselves are ignorant? Must we change our customs and listen to this woman? Did he really choose her and prefer her to us? Well, you can just see the sparks flying with Peter, can't you? I mean, he's just, you know, how can he tell us that, you know, tell her that that he didn't tell us? And that really hurt Mary's feelings. I mean, how would you feel if somebody called you a liar? It's like, well, yeah, he really did tell me this. Mary wept at these comments with only Levi speaking up for her, calling out Peter's hot temperament and the fact that he was repudiating a woman just like our adversaries do. The teacher held her worthy, so who are you to reject her? Surely the teacher knew her very well, for he loved her more than us. So, so there you have one of the disciples actually admitting that Jesus really did uh, love Mary more than, and he did the, the other disciples. So that gives you kind of a, an overview of the gospel of Mary Magdalene. Um, and I would recommend if you really want to know more is get some translations of the gospel of Mary Magdalene and, and really, really look at it and, and see what you think. You know, there's a lot of problems today. When you look at our world today and you look at, uh, at the, uh, the uh, that big church in California that just uh, got thrown out of the Baptist convention because they allowed a woman to be a pastor. She was the wife of the pastor. He calls his wife a pastor. She's in charge of all the Sunday school stuff. And, uh, and the ba Baptists found out that they actually had a woman uh, that was called a pastor. And so they threw... Uh, they threw a Saddleback Church. It's called Saddleback Church. It was a part of the Baptist Convention. So I just threw them out. I said, you're not Baptist anymore because you allow women to be teachers. So you look at this and it's like, how many, how many, uh, how many hundreds of years, you know, two centuries we've been dealing with this about the idea of whether or not women can, can be pastors, whether women can be disciples, whether it was possible for Jesus to have an intimate relationship with a woman and teach her things that he did not teach the disciples. So I would really recommend you get um, uh, some of the, uh, there's several translations of the gospel of Mary Magdalene out there and uh, with commentary. And I think you would really enjoy it. So now we're moving on to the gospel of Thomas, which um, it's really, uh, it's really one that people tend to study more than, um, than others because it has a lot more of the um, Christian overtones in it. And look at this. Um, now, don't, this one shouldn't be confused with the Book of Thomas. There is a Gnostic um, writing called the Book of Thomas. And so don't confuse the Gospel of Thomas with the Book of Thomas. Which is, uh, which is different. And also there's another one called the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. Now the Infancy Gospel, I think is fascinating because it talks about Jesus' childhood. Uh, we think that everything in Jesus' childhood was lost, that we know nothing of his childhood from the time that he was um, uh, that from the time that he was, what, two, three, they, they came back after being uh, uh, exiled into Egypt for a while after Jesus' birth. And they, the, the infancy gospel of Thomas talks about his childhood. And a very interesting book. If you're going to read these books about Thomas, be sure and read the infancy gospel of Thomas. Now, let's see. Okay. Some of these books, these, this one, I'm using this one, it's called The Gospel of Thomas. It's, uh, 
it's translated, annotated by Stephen Davies. And when you look at the Gospel of Thomas, it's a lot of it is confusing. While it is primarily just a list of uh, a list of sayings, it's basically sayings. It's just one saying after the other. It's sort of a wisdom book, a wisdom sayings. Um, and we know that Thomas uh, was the doubter, doubting Thomas, and that he, uh, he was also the one most dedicated to Jesus. And there's a lot of similarities. I think why Christians are more apt to like the Gospel of Thomas or believe the Gospel of Thomas more so than, say, other Gnostic uh, writings is because it is very familiar uh, with the canonical Gospels. A lot of the same sayings as in the, the canonical Gospels. And there's a, there's a, uh, Andrew Harvey did the uh, forward commentary in this particular book to the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, and, and he notes that this interest is due to the fact that uh, this gospel is, as he says, the clearest guide we have to the vision of the world's supreme mystical revolutionary, the teacher known as Jesus. Now, uh, was Jesus the supreme mystical revolutionary? I don't know. Um, perhaps. Um, and where did he get some of this? I, I think that if he is um, representing some of the mystical traditions, I think he probably got that if, in fact, he did uh, spend his uh, childhood uh, from the age of 13 to 30 uh, in India, where, of course, there's a lot of mystical teachings in, among Buddhism and Hinduism. Um, the Gospel of Thomas makes clear that Jesus discovered the alchemical secret of transformation that could have permanently altered world history. I think it probably did alter world history because he taught things that were very different at that time, very different than just obedience to law. Um, he taught obedience to love. Uh, and making it clear that all human beings who dare awaken to the potential splendor of their inner truth and responsibilities for transformation of the world that had been inspired within them, what Harvey calls kingdom consciousness. And, you know, Jesus said, you know, when asked, where is, where is the kingdom of God? And, and Jesus said, it is within. So there is a possibility that transformation is possible, uh, especially when we know within, when we go within, when we find our inner being. And, and being a Gnostic text, the focus on this inner being is key to our transformation. We are never transformed by what is without. We are always transformed by what is within. That only when you know yourself that inner divine, can you be transformed? And it's only when we are transformed from within, can we transform the world? Um, and Jesus said, if you do not know yourselves, then you exist in poverty and are that poverty. And, and what kind of poverty is that? That's the, the spiritual poverty. That's the, this and watch, if you don't have spiritual wealth, if you don't know yourself, if you don't know, get rid of that ignorance and, and understand how, who you are, how all phenomena are created. What is that pistis, that knowledge, that inner knowing that can help you once you transform yourself, the world will be transformed. Uh, there, there was a meme that was going around on the internet a number of years ago. It says, uh, when, you, uh, when you look at, let's see, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And so this idea of, of your inner knowing uh, that, that helps you transform the world. Uh, years ago, uh, when I was going to a, 
a Buddhist Sangha and every Sunday morning they had what they called prayers for world peace. And the teacher would always start out by saying, you know, we, we call this prayers for world peace. We're here, you know, to pray, but we're to pray for our own peace because without inner peace in yourself, there can be no external peace out there in the world. And Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within. So when we transform ourselves to be like the divine, and, and it might call it a new birth, um, uh, with the, uh, you know, people talk about new birth, having a rebirth of spirit, a rebirth of soul, with the mastery of the divine child. Remember, Jesus said that unless you become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And so this idea of, of always being aware of, of what it is like to be able to transform ourselves and become as little children. In other words, be open to things, be open to the newness of life, be open to the newness of the spirit, uh, which brings the seeker into unity with the one, transcending duality. You know, this world is a world of duality. Um, and, and so then we can become one with the divine. Gnostics believe that this transformation takes place through the divine feminine, a wisdom or Sophia. Once you have knowledge, then you can gain wisdom. Uh, you can't have one without the other. And, and wisdom or Sophia, who in the Gnostic tradition is the dual nature of God or the mother. Only those um, who have awakened to the kingdom within and without will be able to view life and creation with all the power needed to be directed by God. So we have the, the idea of the inner and the outer, and that's a big theme uh, here in the Gospel of Thomas. The order of the transformation must be undergone by every seeker if kingdom consciousness is to be realized. Um, and, and that transformation is a huge idea in most religious traditions. You must be transformed, be ye transformed. Uh, so beyond duality into unity. Uh, in the Gospel of Thomas, it says, when you make the two into one, going beyond the impotence of duality to begin to describe reality, of duality to reality, uh, from duality to unity. And, and a lot of people don't understand um, the idea of duality which is what we experience because we're always experiencing the, the objective and the subjective, the subjective, me in here, the objective, you, everything around me is, is the subject. Um, and going beyond duality uh, and describe reality and the unity that comes when you understand reality. The mystical union makes possible a physical transformation. Sri Aurobindo, the great Hindu philosopher, saw that only an integral transformation can provide the force and inspiration to change, to experience the change that must occur if humanity is to survive and evolve. And, and I think that is, is very important. The, the integral transformation, the going from the duality of say just uh, you know mind and body or spirit uh, and body uh, to where you understand the the integration of mind and and spirit mind and body mind and spirit mind uh, psyche soul so it's the same word as as uh, as uh, for soul some of the uh, some of the sayings uh, and people who study the canonical gospels will recognize the sayings of Jesus in the gospel of Thomas. Um, the gospel of Thomas conceives of the kingdom of heaven as existing within and outside, both the inner and the outer. You see a lot of writing about the inner and the outer. Its discovery comes from illuminating the world with light from within oneself. And that light comes from knowing oneself. It's, it's that inner knowing that gives us light. One does not have to uh, 
uh, does not have access to one's light unless you uh, turn inward to see that. In turn, the lack of access to the light keeps one from illuminating the kingdom within. And people talk about enlightenment. Uh, the Eastern philosophies talk a lot about enlightenment. And what is that? It's the illumination of the inner. It's the illumination from your inner divine. And so first and foremost, to, to get there, uh, you have to know oneself, you know, the Oracle of Delphi, know thyself. Uh, to substitute knowledge in general for self-knowledge is completely misguided. And, you know, I, I'm probably really guilty of this. I, I read so many books, <laughs> so many, and, and, and sometimes you have to catch yourself and you say, but it's not there. It's not, it's not all there. Uh, where, where is my self-knowledge? Who am I? You know, where is my transformation? How can I be transformed so that I can help transform the world? Jesus said in the Gospel of Thomas, one who knows everything else, but who does not know himself knows nothing. And I, I think that's something, you know, as seekers, you know, we, we all need to recognize that. We all need to know that, that you can know everything else, but if you do not know yourself, you know nothing. Many fundamentally esoteric and mystic Christian sayings uh, in this book, uh, this gospel is directed to a limited group of elect people. A lot of these, uh, especially the gospels, the Gnostic gospels were written to a select group of people who actually understood uh, the mystical aspects of these, that understood what it means to to reconcile the inner with the outer and the outer with the inner. And Jesus said, whoever finds the correct interpretation of these sayings will never die. And, and I think that's very interesting because it doesn't mean that you will never physically die, but you will never experience true death because you will always experience rebirth. There's life. There's death, rebirth, life, death, and rebirth. If you understand these things, you will never die because you don't have that capacity to, uh, to die forever. You give up your material body, but your spiritual body will always be alive. The seeker should not stop until he finds. When he does find, he will be disturbed. After having been disturbed, he will be astonished. Then he will reign over everything. And I've always thought that was kind of an interesting, uh, you know, when, when you find, you know, this, it doesn't say what you're to find. The seeker should not stop until he finds. Finds what? Well, that would be your personal truth, which may not be my personal truth, but it would be your personal truth. You are like an intelligent lover of wisdom. And when you, when you find this, when you find this wisdom, you will be disturbed. And after having been disturbed, he will be astonished. And, and you have to kind of think about that. What, what is astonishing about what we as theosophists learn? What is astonishing about how we find our personal truth? When we get this, aha. And then it says you will reign over everything. Well, reign over what? Particularly ourselves. We will know ourselves. We will be able to understand ourselves and we will be able to achieve wisdom. And after asking his disciples what he could be compared to, Matthew said, you are like an intelligent lover of wisdom. And that's so true. The Pistis Sophia, the Sophia, the creator of wisdom. Thomas said he could not possibly say what Jesus is like. Then he took Thomas aside and taught him secret sayings. And there is um, another Gnostic book called uh, the, uh, the Secret Sayings uh, that you can, can find out some of those, what they are, and, and get the commentaries on that. When the other disciples asked Thomas what Jesus taught him, Thomas replied, if I tell you even one of the sayings that he told me, you would pick up stones and throw them at me, and fire would come out of those stones and burn you up. So... It must have been something astonishing because he said you would be astonished. You would be disturbed by what he would tell you. And, 
And although he doesn't go into detail about what that would be, uh, it would be astonishing. It would, it would be like fire coming out of those stones and burn you up. You wouldn't be able to believe it. And so this was really written for uh, people who were looking for the mystical side of things. If you fast, you will bring sin to yourselves. Now here we're, we're getting into this idea of the law, laws and rites and rituals, rules. Um, if you fast, you will bring sin to yourselves. And if you pray, you will be condemned. And if you give to charity, you will damage your spirits. When you go into a region and walk around in the rural areas, whenever people receive you, eat whatever they provide for you and heal their sick. For what goes into your mouth will not defile you, but what comes out of your mouth can defile you. Now here you can see Jesus addressing these ideas of the Jewish law. Um, you know, they had food laws. They had many food laws. Um, and even the Buddha, and here again, maybe Jesus learned this uh, if in fact he was in India for 17 years. When you go into a region and walk around, whenever people receive you, eat what they provide for you. And, and that was what the Buddha always told his disciples. Um, even though, uh, you know, obviously, they were, uh, they were vegetarians, uh, they didn't eat meat, but the Buddha always told his, his followers, if someone puts meat in your bowl, eat it and be grateful. Eat what they provide for you because that was given to you and compassion and gratitude. So don't let the law, you know, people get attached to the law and they're up here. I obey the law. Uh, don't let that interfere with being compassionate with people, being grateful to what you're given. Uh, and, and fasting, you know, some people fast. Fasting is, is fine. But why are you fasting? Uh, if you're fasting to prove that, you know, oh, I'm, I'm so much better than other people because I fast twice a week or whatever, uh, then, then that, that's disturbing. That's, that's not what it's for. Uh, and he says, you'll bring sin to yourselves. And if you pray, you will be condemned. Why are you praying? Are you praying, you know, uh, give me things, let me do this, let me do that. Um, you know, why do you pray? Um, and he says, if you give charity, you will damage your spirits. Why do we give to charity? See, there's always a flip side to this. Do you give to charity out of compassion and altruism? Or are you giving to charity because uh, you'll get your name and the local paper is being, you know, or they, you know, will they name a building after you or a group after you? And why are you doing these things? Uh, and then he says, you know, don't, don't be worried about, you know, what you eat. For what goes into your mouth will not defile you, but what comes out of your mouth will defile you. So defy the law. Do not live by law, but by compassion. And I think that was one of the primary things that, that Jesus taught uh, was, you know, and it's why he rejected Jewish law. He absolutely rejected Jewish law. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. Mustard is a weed that can quickly take over a field of newly broken ground. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. And if, if you plant it, wherever you plant it, it will grow. And he's teaching people to, you know, teach this, this you know, teach what he's teaching them. Uh, find the kingdom of heaven uh, because that will, it, will, it will grow. It will expand and people will find compassion and love. And that will, that will in turn transform the world. When can one enter the kingdom? Where you, when you make the two into one and when you make the inside like the outside and the outside like the inside, the male and the female, the same, that the male isn't, a ma isn't male, typo there, isn't male and the female isn't female, then you will enter the kingdom of heaven. There's a lot of commentaries about, uh, and this sort of gets into a little bit, there's a lot of uh, uh, scriptures in the Gospel of Thomas that talk uh, kind of about androgyny and, and androgynous uh, humans. Um, and, and obviously we know that we, we each have male and female in us, just that female 
uh, became greater when we were, you know, in the womb uh, than the male, or the male became greater in the womb. Um, and so you look and you say, okay, what about the androgynous aspects of the Gospel of Thomas? I would love to get into this. Um, I'm working on an essay now uh, using the, the uh, secret doctrine and, and Blavatsky's, uh, the information she gave about androgynous uh, humans. But it's about, it's about the unity. It's about the unity. When we've gone beyond duality into unity, God made humankind, both male and female. You know, in the, in the Genesis, it says, you know, uh, that God made uh, man, you know, male and female, created he them. Um, and so each person is, in is endowed with this divinity that's within all of us. Love your brother as your own soul. Again, love, not law. Not so much law, obeying laws, it's love. You see the splinter in your brother's eye, but you do not see the log that is in your own eye. Remove the log from your own eye, and then you can clearly see to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. You know, and, and some of the uh, uh, King James uh, New Testament language, it talks about the moat. Remove the moat from your own eye. Then you can see to remove the moat from your brother's eye. If you do not fast from the world, you will not find the kingdom. Fasting from the world I means, you know, don't get involved. And in one place he says, be passers-by. You know, be passers-by. Don't get really involved uh, in, the, in all the material things in the world. Kind of stay, you know, stay back from that and remove yourself from that. When Jesus' disciples said to him, come, let us pray today. Let's fast. Jesus responded, what have I commit, commanded? How have I been overcome? What good does following ritual law or dogma do to help one gain the kingdom? Again, Jew, Jesus was rebuking Jewish law. Andrew Harvey comments, the problem is that prayer and fasting are modes of repentance and repentance presupposes sins that are in need of repentance. Jesus say, in saying 104 and implicitly denies any sin and therefore has no need to pray and fast. Thomas was a favored follower of Jesus. It's been said in ancient stories, such as the reluctant messenger from a manuscript found in a Buddhist monastery shown to Nicholas Rohr, that Jesus spent 17 years of his youth and young manhood in India, studying Buddhist teachings. Thomas, it has been said, traveled with Jesus back to India after he was revived in the tomb. Um, and uh, Thomas would uh, supposedly went to Southern India uh, in Madras and Jesus stayed in Northern India in Srinagar, Kashmir. And where uh, he taught Christianity. In fact, Thomas is relatively uh, revered in Southern India. And each year the Christian community in Madras celebrates Thomas's life and death. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> There we go. Um, does anybody have any questions or? Yes, Dorothea. Um, that was fast. That was a wonderful presentation, Claire. Um, I also can consider myself a student of the Gospel of Thomas. And um, I have so many comments I could make, but. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was that there's an excellent BBC documentary on um, Jesus in yeah. India. And one of the other things is that, um, you know, I believe, I believe that theory. And when I read the Upanishads, that just settled it for me because so much of that is in the words of Jesus in the right. gospel. Right, right. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I've uh, I've uh, often shown those uh, BBC documentaries, and um, I give a two-hour class on it. Uh, particularly uh, uh, every Easter, I give a two-hour class over at uh, community college, where I teach an older adult, um, you know, in a class program there, and um, I, I I title it 
uh, did Jesus really die on the cross? And, uh, and I also teach one about the infancy gospel of Thomas, about Jesus, uh, his childhood in India too. So yeah, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And, and like you say, if you read the Upanishads, if you read, and you know, if you study Buddhism, you can see all of that, those threads that, that run through. Well, because the Gnostic, you know, people that started Gnosticism, uh, they traveled, everybody traveled, uh, wasn't new, things weren't new and different. Um, everybody knew what was going on and they all developed their theologies and their philosophies around other things, just like we do today. So, yeah, yeah, those are fascinating. I, I love those BBC documentaries. <laughs> Can I say one more thing? Sure, sure. One in the Logion 104 about seeking and finding and being astonished. Um, I, I don't see that as being my personal truth, but I, the, I see it as the universal truth that expresses itself through me. Right. Yeah. Very good. I'm, I'm glad there's a lot of people out there that study these. I find them fascinating. I, I'm always, it's always fun to meet people like you and, and Sheila and some of those that, that study these things because it's, it's very cool to talk about it. <laughs> um, it's, um, does anybody else have any comments or questions? It's, uh, we're about up with our time here, but um, Hopefully we'll be able to do some more of these. Yeah, Sheila. Thank you very much, Claire. That was a good presentation, thanks. Well, it's good, be, it's good emailing you back and forth. <laughs>